four speakers who are going to share some short uh, comments about uh, their role in the uh, uh, second year of On Farms program. And we'll start off right away with Don King from the Soil Resource Group. So over to you, Don. Great, thanks, Bronwyn. Uh, Soil Resource Group is proud to be partnering with, uh, with Soil and Crop and, uh, and in effect, uh, OMAFRA on the subject and conducting the soil health research and monitoring. Uh, part of it. Um, we are into our, our end of our second year now, and we have one more year of our three season monitoring. Next slide. So our cell, soil health sampling is, is being done across all these 33 site cooperators um, that are being involved. So eight of those at the priority sub buttershed uh, uh, within the, uh, the basins of Lake, Lake Huron and, uh, and Lake Erie. Um, and those areas that are impacting the Western Basin, Lake Erie. The remaining 25 were selected by us to, uh, to really capture the predominant soil types in, in five regions across the province, um, being representative of also operation types um, that we see across the province as well. Next slide. The BMPs that we're focusing on um, within On Farm on all sites uh, deal in three areas of emphasis cover crops and organic amendments and reduced tillage. You'll see examples here uh, that we, uh, we had, uh, uh, had done this year. Um, in each of these sites, we do have side-by-side -side strips and uh, one being a check. And then farmers have the choice of choosing BMPs that they're interested in that fit within their system. So uh, we have another strip of a, a BMP most of the time being cover crop. A second strip could be another type of cover crop or organic amendment. And the third being um, a combination, which you see in site six there, where uh, we're applying mineral onth well on a cover crop. Uh, so this year, we had certainly a lot of different interesting uh, adoption of VMPs. Certainly in, in site one, you'll see uh, that's not a particularly short uh, crop of corn. It's um, corn planted at 60 inch rows, which um, uh, were, were done to see what uh, the effect of um, uh, establishing a cover crops on those wider rows could be, if we can still maintain some economic productivity as well to match what's, what's already going on. Next slide. The mix of crops that we're, we're uh, working with, the guys are mostly within a, uh, a three crop rotation of corn, soy, and wheat. You can see back in last year's um, designs, we had a, a heavy weighting in winter wheat, and that was um, really to allow us to kickstart BMPs after the, the wheat crop and, and being allowed to plant cover crops and organic amendments. Uh, this year, of course, we would move to a, a lot of fields of corn. We had a lot of corn to harvest. Um, and then just a, a quick point, uh, the one other there is a, a, a sugar beet crop. You'll see a picture in the bottom left where uh, that cooperator was planting um, in the spring there with a, a double row of cereal rye to provide some protection. So a lot of interesting things that were, were, were being experimented with. We have um, as well organic amendments that uh, were, were done on many of the sites last year, but a uh, little bit more restricted this year with the corn crop, but still variations of uh, different manure types and uh, biosolid types. The reduced tillage uh, were, uh, were done throughout most of our, our sites, and certainly this year there was perhaps a little bit more tillage, but um, dominantly uh, no-till, uh, vertical till, and some strip till going on there. You'll also see pictures of some hardworking people that, uh, that are involved in the project. Next slide. So we, uh, we were certainly um, uh, given some opportunity to, to engage farmers, uh, although we're still a little bit restricted, of course, in this, this uh, era of, of a pandemic. Uh, but we did uh, demonstrate some of the findings on these sites dealing with soil degradation that is occurring. And uh, this is really critical uh, to our characterizing of soil health and yield potential. Next slide. So this example at site 12 is certainly a dramatic uh, representation of the effects of, of past management. And certainly at this site that's susceptible to tillage erosion, uh, the farmers are now facing the challenge of how to improve soil health at these poorly productive uh, upper landscape positions uh, through the adoption of different BMPs. You'll see in the foreground on the bottom there, that's where we have located strips on this particular field that are draped over this, um, this ridge looking at 
lower, mid, and upper soil landscape positions. Next slide. So the package of, of indicators that we're using, uh, this is the full suite that we used last year in our baseline year. Um, this year, we had a, a reduced uh, budget, but we selected some key parameters certainly there um, that are colored in blue. Organic matter, obviously uh, um, an interest of, of many in terms of, of being able to show soil health, and it really represents the more stable portion of the, of the carbon in our soils. Um, active carbon is really what's moving more towards that uh, stable form. The sulfate carbon and sulfate nitrogen test generally measure what's going on in the, the much smaller biological portion of the organic matter. And it really indicates uh, a quicker change in the soil from changes in management, such as the adoption of a BMP. Next slide. So just to give some high level findings, certainly uh, the, the data set is quite large. We've got 900 essentially um, data points for, for each of our measurements. The trends are uh, with these indicators that I mentioned, certainly that they are quite positively related with organic matter, not as a surprise, but um, certainly active carbon and uh, soil nitrogen or the SLAN test uh, move uh, in, in a, a strong positive relationship. So the carbon CO2 we're finding is a bit of a tighter relationship, not quite the response of the others. Um, and then when we flip that and combine the, the CO2 and that other octave uh, carbon uh, test, we do see, uh, a, again, a good strong relationship. I've added the orange dots there, which represent the edge of field sites, just to give you an idea where they fall in a certain dew stretch uh, along those, those, dew, the, the, those different ranges of, of results. Um, even though those edge of field sites all are largely fine to fine loamy textured soil. So interesting that we still see that variability within those sites. Next, please. So just as a quick summary then. So findings uh, to date certainly are, are that um, in our soil health assessments across our sites, there's certainly a, a, a large range of degradation in severity and uh, certainly historic tillage erosion is predominant, I think in all landforms across southern Ontario. Uh, certainly there's near surface soil compaction we're observing and that of course is, is a risk in uh, heavy textured soils. And in the greater degree of degradation certainly has shown impacts on plant growth and productivity in particular yield. The indicators of soil health show significant differences, certainly by soil type and landscape position, position at all sites um, with organic matter. Um, there is certainly uh, increases of clay content, clay content and uh, at lower positions. And indicators are moving for the most part positively with, with the different changes in organic matter. Next slide. When we're introducing BMP, certainly after one year, it, uh, it's preliminary stages, it's uh, a little bit unclear, but there are some definite uh, suggestions of, of measurable effect of BMPs at some of these sites that are showing some, uh, some sensitive um, indicator changes and shifts, uh, more so than we see um, any change in organic matter. So with our active carbon and our SLAN test, we see uh, certainly greater variability than the, than the Salvita CO2 or our respiration test. But the data suggests that um, uh, preliminary results would be that um, previous crops certainly has an influence on these indicators. So there's a number of factors here that we, we do have to keep in mind when, when measuring soil health and using these tests that uh, could be an influence. I'll just land off saying certainly that um, the farm cooperators are uh, a key to further developing this, uh, this understanding um, in adopting different BMPs and economics play a very important role. We're doing cost benefit analysis, but in just the one example of, of trying a 60 inch corn, um, as Nick Stockman has, has let us know, and you'll hear from him later, it didn't pay, but there's lots of factors there that are, are being explored and, uh, and farmers are looking at uh, ways of, of how they may be incorporating these different uh, soil health uh, BMPs. Um, and then, I think uh, Andy, most farmers would agree and the sentiment being that, that really what's required is a long-term commitment uh, really to work on the change in soils to, uh, to see a benefit and a change in the crop. So thank you.
Well, thank you, Don. That's a great overview and it really gives a flavor of all the detailed findings you're coming up with uh, through this work, which is great. I have one quick question from the audience. I'm going to uh, squeeze it in here and then I'll, that'll give me a chance to remind the following three speakers that they have five minutes maximum to uh, get their presentations in. But Deb Campbell's wondering, Don, if there are any additional agronomic measurement or observations beyond yield made, such as pest issues, residue issues, seeding issues. Are you doing any of those other types of observations? And just a quick answer. As part of our agronomic monitoring, we do track that. And uh, I guess the hope would be that there's not a, a part preferential effect uh, in one treatment over another. So that's part of our monitoring program. Um, and if there's anything that, that does come out, we'll certainly be hoping to catch that. Awesome. Thank you. Great. And thanks for that overview again, Don. And we'll uh, be able to ask you questions as the morning goes on, I'm sure. So I'll turn things over now quick to Craig Irwin from the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority for a no more than five minute overview of land management survey data collection using GIS applications. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Bronwyn. Yeah, I'm going to just give a, a brief overview of how we've leveraged GIS in the data collection aspect for our land management surveys. Uh, next slide. So what exactly are the land management surveys? Uh, conservation authorities are gathering field activity information over multiple years, uh, beginning from 2018. And we're working with agricultural producers within already established priority sub watersheds. So what this means is we're collecting data about what's going on in the landscape. So farming practices, crops, best management practices, there's a whole suite of data we're trying to collect. And this data will be used by the watershed modeling team. Next slide. There's five conservation authorities carrying out the surveys. And what I really want you to focus on in this map are these red areas. So these are the priority sub watersheds. And this is where we're focusing our surveying efforts on. So this is where we're going to, we're talking to farmers within those areas about their what's going on on their farm. Uh, next slide. When developing the land management survey, there's quite a few things and logistics that we had to uh, take into account. First off was we wanted to have a place where all five conservation authorities could input their data into one database instead of having five separate ones that would have to be amalgamated after the fact. We wanted to try to streamline data collection methods, try to move away from that pen and paper recording and then you'd have to come back to the office and then digitize it later. Uh, a bonus would be if we could instantly spatially link the data uh, because otherwise we have to wait for all the surveys to be conducted and then do that after the fact. And since this data is going to the modeling team, we wanted it to be all packaged up nice and neatly for them so it could be easily shared. This is where GIS comes in. And I used a combination of survey one, two, three, and field maps to kind of put this survey together. Uh, next slide, please. I'm just gonna give a, a brief overview of how the, the survey works. Uh, so first off is field maps, and think of it as a, a mobile data collection tool using a map. So you open up the application, you have all these farm fields on the, on the map, you tap on a field that you want to conduct a survey for. This pop-up shows up on the right. And embedded within this pop-up is a URL link. And when you open, you click on that link, it opens up survey one, two, three. And that's the survey for that specific field. Next slide. So survey one, two, three, it's best to think of it as a form-centric data collection application which really makes it perfect to enter the data associated with what crops are grown, when were they planted, uh, fertil what fertilizers were used, best management practices, et cetera. The cool thing is linking between field maps and survey one, two, three allows for us to pre-populate some of the answers and that kind of increases the efficiency of the whole process. When you complete your survey and you're happy with it, you submit it to uh, an ArcGIS cloud-based server. Uh, next slide. And this data can all be accessed through web a website. Uh, it's not public facing right now, but it's really nice uh, for me because I can see 
the entire picture right away and get results for each question. So on the right here, this is just uh, an example of one of the questions in the survey. What types of crops have been grown in the last five years? And it's really cool. So this graph will update live as surveys are being submitted. So additionally, uh, each, each question in the survey will have some sort of graphic associated with it and they're all customizable. So we can get a, a quick snapshot of what the answers are. And, it, and like I mentioned before, we can actually export and share the data with the modelers from this website. Next slide. Overall, there's been quite a few benefits to using uh, Survey123 and field maps. One of the things that I really like from a, a data management point of view is we can control the data entry so they follow a set, uh, set list of vocabulary for consistency. So what I mean is instead of just typing in uh, what crops have been grown, there's actually a drop down menu and you select from a, a predetermined list. So this helps to eliminate uh, typos and things like that. So it's a QAQC, the data built in. It, the apps are pretty, pretty user friendly, no GIS experience is required previously. And the conservation authorities are conducting the surveys uh, right now. So I hope to have lots of exciting results to uh, talk about in the future. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Craig. That uh, sounds super exciting. Uh, my inner GIS nerd is coming out. <laughs> it's been a long time since I did anything with GIS, but it seems like a really uh, important uh, tool to be testing. And I can't wait to see the results in the future. Uh, so that's really great. So thanks for sharing that overview with us today. And hopefully some people have some questions, but it looks really, um, really, really interesting. So thank you. And I will turn it over now to a little bit more on uh, some the technology piece that's happening with the on-farm research um, overall project. So we're happy to have Dr. Wang Hong Yang here from the University of Guelph and to talk about modeling in the watershed evaluation of BMPs and ecosystem services assessment tool. Dr. Yang, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Bowen. And uh, so it's such a privilege for us to be part of the on-farm program to conduct BMP modeling. And good morning to all colleagues. Uh, it's amazing we have about uh, 170 uh, participants. And uh, I uh, connect with some of you and also work with some of you for over the years. And it's great to see you. And also it's very nice to meet other colleagues and hope to get more connection with you. So from this project and my colleague Dr. Shan Xiao is coordinating this project with me. And also today, and I have my team and uh, Nora Hopkins and Dr. Um, Rodrigo Miranda and uh, Jubro uh, Bello and uh, Kim Bello and uh, join us today. And also that so we have a postable, postable from Germany, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Memo Mahuti, and uh, is on the way to come to us, also join us today. Thank you. And the next slide, please. Yeah. So what we are going to do that, we're going to use a model it's called IM Web. And this is a new term to some of you. And uh, this is the model developing our group probably more than 15 years. And probably the most heard about it is SWOT, right? Yes, and we use SWOT as well, and we're still using. And this is, I would say, it's the grid version of SWOT. It's called cell-based model. So then, and uh, there are so many models, you're gonna say, you know, why I claim and say this is the only model in Canada and to do certain things. To me, all models are good. SWOT great, some other models are all great. But this model has a niche and uniqueness is that we drill down to location, drill down to fill, drill down to farm. And this really are inspired by clinics and actually on the ground. They keep asking me, say, you know, can you go to location to do some examination, right? So that's pretty much how we started about this. Also that's, and uh, for the BMP assessment, and we all know they have a BMP cost side and uh, like um, Dan King talk about carbon and uh, and also biodiversity is about ecosystem goods and services. So because I'm up to the cell based model and it's very naturally can be integrated with those uh, data together to evaluate ecosystem services. So next please. Yeah, so that's pretty much I like to say about this model. And uh, again, on left hand side, this is the USDA picture and so many on ground action going on. Lots of great work. One of the question will be that, you know, what are the effects? And there's so many great monitoring work happening as well. But we coming to here is that joint efforts 
to understand landscape processes and to simulating those processes. And then if we put the BMP in, we know what the effects are. So that's pretty much uh, the mission and we have. So from the right hand side, basically, I just want to say that's what I mean, it's a grid based model. So, and then the entire picture and here about those um, uh, polygons, that's one unit in SWOT, that's a sub basin. But we're, we're getting into more details. We're able to get in the subfield and we're able to know that like a repair and buffer, we can you know, have a, a wide buffer, a narrow buffer, and for wetland restoration, and we can go to individual wetlands. So this is the uniqueness of this um, uh, model and we'll build one. Up to now, we already have about 36 BMPs and in this model, and we're able to model, I would say majority of the, of the, of the BMP uh, on the ground. And of course, we can always add to it. So that's uh, uh, our model. Next, please. So another thing which is, I feel challenges, also our colleagues feel challenges, is the model sometimes is always complex. Oh, this is so complex results and you know, what you are showing and what the things are looks like. So in recent five, six years or so, and we start to, we start to develop web-based tool to make modern results accessible to clinics. So, and what does this model do? Actually, again, I listen to you, clinics, tell me what we should do, right? For example, this tool and is on the web. So, recent, uh, and, uh, right now, we purchased Microsoft Azure Cloud and to host our model results here and our interface here, and then. And also, this is not a public available to everyone. And we have a login system because we want to respect some of the aspect of the, of the, of the data. And then like farmers may have privacy and some other things. So this tool and is really in for us and it's quite advanced even for us because we want to make results accessible to colleagues. For example, this can be used for explore water conditions and what are the hot spots, right? And we, what, what are the existing DMP you know, effects looks like? And in the future, how should we target BMPs and a based on cost effectiveness? So that's the something we would like to do. Thank you. Next slide. So that's a, a, a little bit of progress reports. And I would say that and, uh, we did not start too long ago and about the modern components, but we are very enthusiastic about this project and we already started. So this project, just like I mentioned about it, and based on the um, uh, entire Strong Crop Improvement Association, all monthly requirements, and we need to and develop BMP effectiveness coefficient, and also evaluate cost effectiveness. So this model come in, and uh, I just want to say that modeling procedure, and it's very standard. And the first item will be the data. Like we'll talk about a lot of data today. In my career, I always want to say to those colleagues who collect the data, I said, I really appreciate it. It's great efforts, lots of challenges. And we have a conservation clinics and we have a you know, soil resource group, of course, and higher soil crop clinics here. We have a government like OMA for ECCC. And, uh, and like uh, you know, we mentioned today and about those corporate farmers, and it's great. I always want to say I'm a data hungry person. I want to add a piece of data. But we also understand that data is connected to ongoing processes. So for us, and we adapt to that situation. So for example, and the next step we do that, we set up a model and also we kind of validate the model, make sure the model and is realistic and to the condition, right? And then after we kind of validate, that's become more like a laboratory. We start to experiment, you know, change the model like here, change the model over there. What are the BMP factors? What are the future BMP scenario, right? And then not, not the least is what we talk about the web interface for doing that. So when I talk about we adapt to this process is that, and we are going to go ahead and model it. And then if more data come in, we're going to do it again. So this model and uh, again, and it can be used to inform a large geography and uh, about that and transfer the results to the similar areas. But the idea is not just transfer. And if we can expand to the large area modeling, it'd be great. It's ongoing, I just want to say, and I'm, our group is to make use of every funding to expand this our modeling. And for example, right now we're using funding from ECCC and Arts Canada. We're doing like a McGregor and they're doing the um, Big Creek, Cattlefish, Cattle, and a Big Art of those areas. So, and also Medway as well. So now that being said, I'm looking forward to further work and collaborating with colleagues. And so that's what I have today. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Yang. And I understand uh, as you're getting into the modeling that next year for the on-farm forum, you'll have a more in-depth kind of uh, results yeah. to share uh, next yeah. year, which will be exciting to see. So thank you so much for joining us today and giving us a kind of a teaser on where the modeling work for the on-farm research program is going. So that's yeah, really thank wonderful. You. And with that, I will turn things over to Angie Strathoff from OSCIA for some overview highlights from on-farm second year. Thanks, Angie. Hi again, everyone. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, I just uh, want to quickly go through the knowledge transfer and engagement opportunities that uh, that we've been facilitating over the past year. Uh, so we did have several successful ones, despite the challenges of the pandemic. We took full advantage of that window of opportunity in the fall and gathered folks first at Free Gen Organics Farm, uh, which was hosted by Brett Israel, and secondly at Woodrow Farms, hosted by Greg Hannum. Next slide. At those sites, through funding from OMAFRA, OSCIA has assembled a mobile demonstration suite that consists of two trailers and a wealth of specialized scientific tools, audiovisual gear, and field ready tools. Uh, very handy for physical distancing and taking a deep dive into, uh, into what's going on underfoot with the camera and the display. And you can learn more information about that unit by contacting Soil and Crop. Next slide. We also partnered with the Ontario Soil Network, who came up with a really innovative uh, pivot to a virtual environment and uh, have launched a uh, soil road trip app. So visitors can view uh, seven on-farm cooperator sites on the app, either from the desktop or their mobile devices, and check in at the sites in person. So this is a really great example of, uh, of a collaboration with our friends at OSN. And now I'd like to announce a new on-farm initiative just getting underway, our four enhanced demonstration sites. So as I mentioned earlier this morning, one of the goals of on-farm is to establish a network of long-term demonstration sites and encourage leveraged investment from government, industry, and researchers. So we'll be making a concentrated effort to feature these sites in the coming year. I really want to thank the Enhanced Demonstration Site Network Engagement Committee members who were made up of members from OnFarm's Technical Working Group and Stakeholder Engagement Working Group for their insight into the recommendations for the site selection. Uh, it was a very difficult decision because luckily we had too many qualified sites uh, and enthusiastic committed cooperators, which I think is a real testament to the uh, success of the program. Next slide. So you can see the four sites uh, selected here in green on the map. And again, I'd really encourage everyone to visit the website, explore the interactive map. Uh, my colleague, Alexandra Dacey does an incredible job of maintaining that site and keeping it fresh, fresh with lots of content. So the EDS selection criteria included geography, soil type, operation features and commodity type as well as considering the BMPs that are under investigation at each site and the cooperator's commitment to long-term research, experience, and involvement in other research networks. So although only four sites uh, have been selected at this time, collaborating with other cooperators on engagement and knowledge transfer activities will remain a priority of the program across all sites. It's really important to mention this, uh, this engagement opportunity is it's really making the program more than a sum of its parts. And we want to, uh, for example, also focus um, events in Eastern Ontario to coincide with the timing of the international plowing match in the fall. So with that, I'd like to introduce our enhanced demonstration sites. Our first is, oh, sorry, next slide. <laughs> our first is Norm Lamoth, who you'll be hearing from later this morning. Uh, Norm and his family manage a diverse 500 acre cash crop farm in Peterborough County, which includes a four crop rotation of corn, soybeans, wheat, and oats. Norm has a lifelong interest in supporting soil health and biodiversity through the use of soil amendments, such as biosolids, green manures, as well as compost processed on the farm using municipal leaf and yard waste. Combining extensive soil sampling data, imagery, and variable rate technologies, Norm is keen on demonstrating the economic benefits of being eco ecologically sustainable in a modern cropping system. Norm's on-farm trial is testing the use of cover crops in rotation with an organic amendment. 
The field site is a uniform hill slope on very rolling landscape on a loam till soil. And his soil health goals are to increase organic matter and microbial health and optimize fertility inputs. So in 2020, the site was in corn under no-till management with an interseeded cover crop. And this past year, there were soybeans under no-till um, that received an organic amendment application for. Next year, they'll be looking at oats under no-till management. So as I mentioned, we'll get to hear from Norm uh, later this morning in our panel discussion, and we're really grateful for his cooperation uh, and looking forward to that later. Our second enhanced demonstration site is 3Gen Organics with Brett Israel in Wallingston in, Wallenstein in Wellington County. This on-farm site is a swine operation under organic management comparing two different interseeded cover crop mixes. The field site is very gently sloping on a clay loam till soil, and Brett soil health goals are to obtain a balanced soil from a crop rotation in a self-sustaining organic system. They continue to grow corn and soy, but they love the way small grains and cover crops allow them to quickly adapt to weather and market changes. Integrating livestock into their operation has given them extra flexibility with the option to feed the cover crops. In 2020 and 2021, the site was in corn under minimum tillage with two early interseeded cover crop mixes. And next year, they'll be looking at soybeans under minimum till management. Their hog operations and all their cropping fields are certified, or certified organic and 3Gen continues to grow their business, most recently by opening an on-farm country shop that works with local vendors and is striving to be a community hub centered around sustainable food production. Brett is also a participant in Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Living Lab program, where he works with OSCI, Ecological Farmers Association of Ontario, and AAFC researchers in an innovative collaboration. Thank you, Brett. Our third site is Tyler McBlain, located in eastern Brant County. Alongside his wife and parents, Tyler operates a custom farming business and grows corn, soybeans, wheat, and oats. The soils are mostly heavy Haldeman clay, meaning compaction issues, crusting, and drainage issues are always top of mind. The McBlains have learned to combat these issues with a long-term commitment to no-till, strip-till, variable rate nutrient applications, and multi-species cover crops. You can hear more about Tyler's site in the Soil Health Concurrent session this morning. The best management practices tested at his on-farm site is a comparison of cover crops on a field that has been managed well next to a neighboring field uh, that is more degraded. The soil health goals are to increase organic matter and other soil health indicators. So in 2020, that site was uh, in winter wheat under no-till management, followed by a cover crop mix. And this past year uh, under corn with strip-till management, followed by a cover crop. And next year, like many of the other sites I've mentioned already, will be in soybeans under no-till management. So we're looking forward to hearing more from Tyler. And our fourth site is in Southern Essex County, where Henry Denoter farms with his family growing corn, soybeans, and wheat. Cover crops are also a big part of Henry's rotation. Recently, he's experimented with buckwheat. He began adopting soil and water quality best management practices decades ago and continues to practice minimal soil disturbance, in-field erosion control, and nutrient management. The Weigel Farm Edge of Field site is a 48-acre parcel of clay loam that is committed to using conservation practices, including no-till, and uses a full crop rotation. The parcel has three distinct overland swales where weirs have been constructed to collect surface water during extreme rain and snow melt events. The data will be used in conjunction with data from other sites involved in the on-farm program to determine BMP effectiveness. In addition to being an on-farm edge of field cooperator, Henry also participates in other water quality monitoring programs in the Weigel Creek area, including the AAFC Living Lab Initiative. Henry was also the recipient of OSCIA's 2021 Soil Champion Award. We'll be hearing more from Henry in the water quality concurrent session and looking forward to it. Those are our enhanced demonstration sites. Um, as I mentioned, there will be lots of other engagement events uh, and virtual engagement opportunities to stay tuned for throughout 2022. So we hope to see you there. Wonderful. 
Thank you, Angie. I uh, appreciate the introduction to all the uh, enhanced demonstration sites. That's great. And uh, we'll have run out of time for questions from the audience, but there will be more time for interaction with the speakers and panelists in the, in the concurrent sessions. 